Uh, so thank you again. I'm going to talk about the crashing asthmatic patient. This can be a very scary patient. We see asthmatics all the time, uh, but the crashing asthmatic can be some of the worst and scariest patients that you can get. So at any time, please obviously stop me if you have any questions. I have nothing to disclose. A quick plug for our website here, jackcms.com. Developed this a couple years ago, and it, we've done uh, some pretty cool things with it. So on there, it's mobile ready, so it's made use on your phone. Uh, lots of education on there, uh, videos, presentations. I'll be having my presentation on there later today. Uh, any field activated STEMI that comes in our hospital, I get it fed back to you guys within about 48 hours, and that can be found on there as well, and also ways to contact us. Also, through Trauma One, we have Facebook activity, and we'll be starting a podcast as well soon. Uh, so once we get that going, and we'll get that information out to you guys. All right, so first off, here's our case scenario. Rescue 1, 48-year-old male with respiratory distress. History of asthma. All right, so we got a 48-year-old male you're called out to, history of asthma. He's out of his medication. Uh, when you get there, he's in respiratory distress. He has tachypnea, bilateral wheezes. He's in a tripoding position. Vital signs, a little tachycardic, uh, normal tensive, fast respirations, and O2 set 86% on room air. So what do you want to do? Any ideas? Brian, what do you want to do? Good job, all right. Anyone want to do this? <laughs> Good, all right, don't do that yet. All right, we got a couple steps before we do that. So, what, to talk about the asthmatic patient, we need to first kind of talk about the fundamentals of what we're dealing with. When we talk about any case in pre-hospital medicine, we always talk about the ABCs. We always worry about airway, breathing, circulation. When we approach the crashing asthmatic patient, we need to have a little different approach, and we'll talk about why that is. We want to have a B, C, and then A approach. So we're going to take care of the breathing, we're going to make sure we stabilize our circulation, and then down the road we're going to talk about protecting the airway. The reason for this is crashing asthmatics plus intubation equals badness. These people like to die on you. This is the one patient when they come in our resuscitation bay looking like crap, we don't want to intubate them. We do everything we can to not intubate this patient because they tend to die on you when you do it. And we'll talk about why that is in a bit. So with, uh, like anything else, we need to have an organized and structure, uh, structured approach to these patients. First off, we're going to stop the process. We'll talk about how we do each of these things. Next, we're going to take steps to avoid intubation. Again, avoid that badness, avoid that patient crashing on you. And next, we're going to optimize our pre-tube condition, just in case we do have to intubate the patient. And obviously, prioritizing uh, safe transport to the hospital. So, stopping the process. To talk about this, we need to figure out what the process is. So, I'm going to let this nice lady explain asthma physiology to us. In people with asthma, a flow of air is restricted due to narrowing of bronchi and bronchioles. Bronchospasm due to asthma is caused by three factors. Constriction of smooth muscles around bronchi and bronchioles. Swelling of cells in airways due to chronic inflammation. Production of extra mucus due to inflammation and asthma triggers. During an asthma attack, the degree of bronchoconstriction is even higher. So the three main things we get in asthma, inflammation, smooth muscle constriction, and mucus production. So you'll see as we go through our treatment how we kind of combat all those issues. So first off, the mild to moderate patient. This is a talk about the severe asthmatic, but we need to know how to treat those mild to moderate cases. So a couple different ways we're gonna attack this. First off, through bronchodilation, then anti-inflammation, and then muscle relaxation. We'll talk about each of these real quick. So bronchodilators, the main ones most of us use are albuterol and epitropium, also known as atrovent. So albuterol is a beta blocker, and then epitropium is going to do smooth muscle relaxation. So again, attacking that problem that we have in asthma, which is our muscle constriction. This is a no-brainer. Evidence is good. We know this works, without question. So this is kind of our first line of defense against these asthmatic patients. Talking about the anti-inflammation, we have steroids. The most common one we use in the field is methylprednisolone, also known as solumedrol. In the ED, you may use prednisone or other oral agents. In terms of evidence, this may take four to six hours to take effect. So yes, you guys are usually giving it, but just know this isn't going to be what turns the patient around in the rig. But there is evidence to show that early steroids are associated with decreased hospital admissions. So the earlier the patients get these steroids, usually by you guys in the field, they're going to lessen their chance of having to get admitted to the hospital. 
So this is good. Play the long game, but if you can't get it, it's okay. If you come into me with a severe asthmatic, hey, I gave them nebs, I put them on BiPAP, I've got an auction on them, but I could not get that line, I'm sorry, I couldn't get the steroids, fine, that's great. You've done what you need to do. You've done the life-saving me measures. Yeah, the steroids do play a role, but they're not that important. Smooth muscle relaxant. The main thing we use for this is mag sulfate. Evidence not great. It's not great for the pre-hospital setting. It's not great for the hospital setting. We're not really sure if this really helps patients, but most benefit is seen in the moderate to severe patients and the ones who are refractory to treatment. So in the ED, those patients that we're giving NEBS to, we're trying oxygen, and they're just not really turning around, that's the patient that we'll put on mag sulfate. Again, in the pre-hospital phase, we tend to run to mag a little quicker. You guys only have five to 10 minutes with the patient and you want to do everything you can. Uh, so again, if they look bad, hang the mag, but if you can't get it, it's okay. All right, so back to our patient. We're gonna check them out real quick. We've given them their NEBS, we've given them solimedrol, we've given them mag sulfate, and now we're getting to the hospital. Good job, life saved. Ah, oh, crap. Well, now we're stuck at the railroad. Uh, if, you, if any of you go to Baptist, you know that can be a problem trying to get in there and getting that train blocking your way. So we're gonna go back and check our patient again. Right now, breathing a little more labored, accessory muscle use, so that it's intercostal muscles are having to be used to get a good breath in. Unable to hear breath sounds, usually not a good thing. So what now? What do you guys want to do? Okay, anybody want to do this? No. All right, hold on a second. We're gonna talk about it later, but don't, don't turn to intubation yet. We have some other tricks that we can use. So the treatment of the severe asthmatic. So take steps to avoid the tube. Again, first we, we reverse the process, and our next step is take steps to avoid the tube. So we're going to reach into our pre-hospital bag of tricks and pull out some things that you guys just mentioned. So first off, non-invasive positive pressure ventilations. There's two forms of this. There's CPAP and BiPAP. Most of our pre-hospital agencies are using CPAP and also epinephrine. All right. So we'll talk about each of these. So non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, we're using this a lot more. This modality is saving lives. In CHF, COPD, this is keeping people from having to be intubated. It's an amazing, amazing tool that we have in pre-hospital and in ED. In terms of evidence, there's no large study. It's mostly poor evidence. What we do know is that it decreases the work of breathing. One big reason why a lot of asthmatics have to be intubated is because they tire out. The diaphragm is a muscle, and you can only work it so much. It's going to get tired. So what the CPAP does is it decreases their the energy they have to expend to get a good breath in. So it's helping them out. Also, they have vasoconstriction, they have bronchoconstriction, they can't get those nebs deep down in the bronchioles and the alveoli. What this does is help stent those airways open a little bit and push those medications deep down to the airways. So if you have it, use it. Epinephrine, it aids in bronchodilation, so it's gonna open your airways, and vasoconstriction, so that in, infla uh, inflammation I talked about in the airway, it's gonna decrease your inflammation. So it's for severe attacks or refractory attacks. So attacks that you've done your NEBS, you've done your CPAP, you've done your MAG, you've done everything else that's still not turning around, epi is gonna be your last choice. It's the same dosing as anaphylaxis. So 0.3 milligrams intramuscular of your one to 1,000 epinephrine. And the next, we're gonna optimize our pre-intubation condition. Again, just in case we have to intubate this patient, how can we make them the best candidate for intubation? Two things we're gonna do, oxygenation, high flow O2. Get these people oxygen. You cannot hurt asthmatics by giving them high flow O2. So as high as it goes, get oxygen in them. Like Dr. Caro talked about, uh, we've all seen that patient that we've properly pre-oxygenated pre for intubation and they're able to hold their SATs for three, four minutes. So get oxygen in these patients. Also, perfusion, take care of perfusion. These people have a high rate of insensible losses. So they are breathing. When you breathe, normally you're, you're giving off a little bit of fluid, insensible losses with every breath. Imagine if you're breathing 40 times a minute, how much, how much fluid you're actually losing. So a lot of these patients come in the emergency, emergency department, we treat them properly, and then my residents are wondering why they continue to be tachycardic. Well, now they're a little hypovolemic because they've been breathing to save their life for the last four hours. So start getting fluids in these patients as well. All right, we're gonna go back to our patient real quick, do a quick recheck. What have we done? We've done BiPAP, we've done solumedrol, we've done mag sulfate, we've done uh, uh, normal saline, we've done oxygen, we've done epi, we've done everything we can, and now, finally, we're gonna get our patient to the hospital and get him in the emergency department. So we'll go back, we'll reassess our situation here. 
Breathing is shallow and slow. They're unable to follow commands. If anyone is an asthmatic and unable to follow commands, and you know they're not drunk or intoxicated, that's bad. That is bad, bad, bad. That means that patient is about to die on you. Okay? Two things that are bad in severe asthmatics. When you can't hear breath sounds and when you can't mentate. A lot of people get comfortable because they can't hear breath sounds. Oh, they must not be wheezing. No, that means they're clamped down so tight they're actually not moving any air. And once a person can't follow uh, commands for you, can't use the BiPAP because they can't follow instructions, they're about to crump. And you're unable to improve saturation with bag valve mask. What do you guys want to do now? Anybody want to intubate? All right, let's do this. All right, this is a good time to intubate this patient. So, but like I said, intubation plus crashing asthmatic equals badness. We've got to be careful with these patients. There's a reason for this. Asthmatics are hypoxic. Asthmatics are hypovolemic. Like I said, they have insensible losses. They're acidotic. They have hypercapnia. What they're doing is trapping CO2 in the alveoli. Their pH is dropping. And they're hyperinflation. So their lungs are hyperinflated. They can't get that air out. Now they have decreased venous return. This is the worst situation you can think of when it comes to intubating a patient. All right, these are, you can't find a worse patient to intubate. When you, all these things add up in the recess bay, we say, hold on, we're not intubating, we gotta, we gotta fix some of these things first. But in the back of the rig, this person about to die on you, you don't have that luxury. The other problem is badness plus taking away their physiologic compensation equals worseness. So this person is tachycardic, they're tachypnic, they are doing some things with their body to keep them alive. You're not going to either RSI them with a paralytic and a sedative or just give them a sedative and you're going to take all that physiologic compensation away. So now they're just going to go down the tube very fast. <coughs> This is Dr. Kerr about an hour and a half ago talking to you guys about difficult airway. This is a difficult airway, not for anatomic reasons. This might be the nice, healthy 24-year-old, but for physiologic reasons. This is a nightmare airway because they're going to crash on you, okay? And you have to, this is part of your airway assessment. Oh yeah, this guy's airway looks beautiful, but hold on. He, he's knocking on death's door. Let's make sure we have a plan. And for this reason, we always want to optimize and plan. Don't muck around and have a plan, plan A, B, and C. Anytime I talk about difficult airways, have a plan A, a plan B, plan C, and be flexible and be ready to switch between those. So if that means with your partner, hey, this guy can crash on me fast, so I want you ready with that scalpel in case I can't get this airway for some reason. Or I want you ready with that King device, that super lock device. I want you ready with a King Vision. I want, or even just using a King Vision. Again, what you're trying to do in these asthmatic patients is decrease your time from sedation to intubation. And so you can start uh, helping them out. So, like I said, we're going to optimize, we're going to give them oxygen, we're going to give them fluids as well. You're going to have your best provider doing the intubation. This is not the time to have the student intubating. Uh, we had actually had a patient just like this a couple weeks ago in the recess bay, and he came in seizing because he was so hypoxic from his, from his asthma, and I went and got the third year to intubate. Our first years always intubate in the, in the emergency department, but this time I got the third year because I knew we literally probably had 10 seconds once we RSI this guy uh, to get the tube in. And also thinking of extra devices, your super glock devices, um, extra glock devices, whatever secondary device may actually become your primary device in this situation. So just again, having a plan, having someone sitting there with the king tube in their hand saying, here's the king tube in case you can't get the intubation. And then also a quick plug for proper medications. Every agency is completely different and your protocols are all different. But if you don't have something like ketamine, I suggest talking to your medical direction about it. In this patient, ketamine is your ideal agent for a couple reasons. It, ca it causes bronchodilation just by the effects of the medication. Less hypotension, actually buffers your blood pressure very well. and also protects respiratory drive. So the patient I just talked to you about, what we did with that patient, we gave him ketamine, probably I think 300 milligrams IV, and then we just intubated intubated him without paralyzing him. So he was actually still breathing on his own while we intubated him. It's called an awake look or a, or a delayed sequence intubation. Because what that did was allow him to continue to have his physiologic compensation while we're intubating him. All right? So again, if you don't have this in your armamentarium, it's something to start talking to your medical direction about. And please contact me because I'll be happy to send the evidence and help you guys out with that. All right, so going back to check our patient one more time. We've got our tube in. We're on our way to the hospital. All right, things are looking good. Oh, it's just not your day. Flat tire, all right. And then you got your shift officer coming right behind you too. This is embarrassing. So just a bad day altogether, all right? So what, we got, what do you have to do? You're still about 10 minutes out from the hospital. We're gonna reevaluate our patient again. Right now, 
Tube is in place, you're bagging, but the patient's hypoxic, they're hypotensive, and you're having difficulty bagging. So every time you squeeze that bag, it's just not working, you're not getting a good breath in. So what do we think about at this point? Anytime you have this where you have a patient on the vent or a patient that you're trying to bag and you're unable to, or they continue to be hypoxic or they're hypotensive, you have to have a process that runs through your brain. Um, because this, again, this means, well, I've done everything I can so far and this patient still isn't getting better or they're getting worse. You have to have a process that runs through your brain. And Dr. Caro introduced you guys to some mnemonics for a difficult airway. This is a nice mnemonic when that patient is crashing even though you got the endotracheal tube in. It's called the dopes mnemonic. You may have heard this before. What this stands for is displacement. We'll talk about each of these. Obstruction, pneumothorax, equipment failure, and stacking your breaths. All right, so this is a nice mnemonic you run through your head. Have I got all these things covered? Is there something simple that I'm missing that's not allowing me to oxygenate this patient? So displacement, one thing, one way we can check that is check is the tube in the right place. So usually what we do is the first thing we do is we put that laryngoscope back into the, uh, into the airway, we put that King Vision back in the airway and make sure we see tube going through the cords. That is the gold standard for making sure you have correct intubation. I don't care about intidal capnography, I don't care about chest x-ray, I don't care about bilateral breath sounds. The gold standard for checking if your tube's in the right place is looking with your eyes to see if the tube's in the right place. So on this patient, we confirm the tube through the cords. Next is obstruction. So is the tube obstructed somehow? Ways it can get obstructed is mucus and secretions can get in the airway uh, or in the tube. You, it can be kinked. A lot of times it's coming out of the mouth and, the, and then it gets kinked. So a couple good ways to check that is put a bougie through there, put a suction catheter, whatever you have, make sure that passes all the way through the tube and that you don't have an obstruction. So in this patient, we're able to pass the bougie through the tube. So it's not displaced, it's not obstructed. Next, pneumothorax. So asthmatics are, have a high risk of pneumothorax. They have, again, hyperinflation of the lungs. And now we're going and we're bagging their lungs as well. So they have a very high risk of getting a pneumothorax. So we're gonna check that with bilateral breast sounds. And in our patient, they have bilateral breast sounds arise. Not very good breast sounds, but they're both there. Our next, equipment failure. So does the bag valve mask have a leak in it? That's not totally uncommon. Um, is our auction not up? Half the time when our, these patients are hypoxic in our recess bay, we look back and realize no one actually connected in the auction. So it's a dumb mistake, but it's a simple mistake. So is your equipment working correctly? If you have vents on your rig, is the vent working correctly? If the vent doesn't seem to work correctly or you're not sure, what should you do? Some of our trauma one guys, what should you do? If you're not sure the vent's working correctly. Disconnect, take the vent out, okay? The vent's a nice fancy computer, but you can't beat a bag valve mask at 100%. So if you're not sure if your equipment's working, simplify your equipment. Take all the computers out of it and just go back to the basics. So our equipment was checked off and working correctly. So what are we left with? We're left with, with, with what's called breath stacking. And this is something we have a high risk of in asthmatic, as asthmatic patients. Like I said, one of the problems is you get this airway inflammation, you get mu mucus production, you get soft tissue and soft muscle uh, constriction. So they're able to get some breaths in, but they can't get them out. So every time they try to exhale, they're not getting all that air out. So they take a nice deep breath in, alveoli expand. Take another breath in. And you can see with each one, they're just getting more and more hyperinflated and not getting the proper exhalation. This is a big problem in our severe asthmatics. And what it does is it impairs gas exchange. So they're hypoxic because now they're just building CO2 and they're not able to exchange those gases. It also impairs venous return. So you think you take a deep breath in, your intrathoracic pressure increases, you collapse your IVC, and now you're not getting blood back to your right heart, you're not able to pump out, your ejection fraction goes down, so now you become hypotensive, all right? So again, big issue with these patients. So what do we do? We have to fix this somehow. What we do is we disconnect the BVM, we allow a full exhalation, and we bag at a slower rate. One issue when we end up intubating asthmatic patients, we said, well, they were breathing at 40 times a minute before I intubate them, so now I'm gonna bag them at 40 times a minute, or now I'm gonna put my vent at 40 times a minute. You don't wanna do that, and the reason for this is breath stacking. When we intubate an asthmatic patient, we actually drop the respirations down to about 10 a minute because I want long exhalation phase. I want them to get every breath all the way out. And sometimes we even disconnect the vent and we give them a big bear, bear hug and we squeeze their chest to let all that air get out to avoid breath stacking. 
All right, so patient disconnected, allowed to exhale, resume back valve mask at 10 breaths a minute, improve blood pressure, improve um, SAO2. And now we finally made it to the hospital. All right, so successful case. Any questions on that? So just to summarize real quick, crashing asthmatic patient, one of the scarier patients you can come across, mainly because a lot of times they're young patients, they're otherwise healthy. You get your 22-year-old kid who's otherwise healthy, and it's just as bad asthma, and he's been out of his inhaler for a week, and now he's about to die. And it's, it's a very difficult case because it's not like some of your other respiratory failures where, oh, I got the tube in, we're good because the process of getting the tube in sometimes kills these patients, and you have to be very careful with them. Um, this is someone that I advocate not mucking around with that airway if you don't have to. If you can get them to, the, to us, stabilized with a relatively good O2 set, awesome. Okay, because I want to have all of our devices at hand. I want to have our most experienced provider. I want to have the proper medications and the proper plan. Because this is an airway that I like to plan in five or ten minutes if I can to make sure all the steps are in place. And it can be really, really, a really tough one. Um, any questions at all? Anything? All right, like I said, uh, check our website out. I'll have my lecture up there at some point soon. And thank you guys so much again for coming.